three, two, one. Welcome back to the Godfo Universe podcast. I'm your co-host and co-creator, Dan Evans, and this is Josh Adams, the talent. I'm just the looks and muscle. And the muscle? <laughs> <laughs> you just said you was the muscle. You the type of muscle that people be eating. M- M-U-S-S-E-L. <laughs> And right, Man, neither one of us are the muscle. And feel free to go to godforuniverse.com. Check out some of the cool stuff we have. If you go to comics, you can see what we've got here. We've got a whole bunch of cool stuff in the Apollyon 20XX universe in that era, which eventually will, this will be broken up in eras. We've got the Lamentations you can read. we got a short film you can watch. More of those coming. We've got the uh, Revelations coming. They're done. We just have to upload them whenever we want to. Uh, we got the Road to Apollo and 20XX blog. We got all this stuff to hold you over while we finish and up. It, probably within a few weeks, I would think we'll have the first chapter of the graphic novel up on there. I yeah, would think along with, the, with everything for the um, pre, pre-order for the uh, and Kickstarter stuff mm-hmm. uh, for, for Volume 1, Live Not By Lies. And so excited for everyone to get a chance to finally read this story and see what we've uh, been able to put together. It's been a journey putting it together, but it's man, it's been so worth it. It's so awesome. I can't wait to release it. Oh, yeah. And uh, sign up for our mailing list right here. You'll get all kinds of cool stuff. And first to know when we're doing things and all that kind of stuff. So with that out of the way, which that's the cool stuff, that's the good stuff. Uh, I wanted to jump into a topic that's pretty close to Josh and I, not only for like what it entails, but like what it means, the repercussions of it. So Mm. someone has done a feminist retelling of 1984 and uh, the person is Sandra Newman. I have no idea who that is. Have you heard that name before, Josh? I wasn't familiar with her. I did read, I I read up on the her take on the story i haven't really uh read up on her personally uh, uh I, I yeah i do know like kind of some of what's her take on the story was which what i know, I know we'll get into this one of the things i thought was interesting was that uh george orwell's son and like the estate signed off on this like they signed off on her take of the of the story and they they thought it was like the only possible uh way to continue that legacy was to have this girl write it so like her the estate loved it um but we'll we'll get into we'll get into that but well i just thought it was interesting no, i actually wanted to start with that like when anytime that i've seen it where it's like the estate approves it that means some family member with 51 percent get paid very well yeah, yep. that's what I was. It's the same thing that's been done with uh, with Dune. Uh, it's the same thing that gets done with Lord of the Rings. Like it's it it reaches a point where the people who genuinely care are are either too old or or dead. Yeah, and you've got somebody down there down the road that says, "Oh, I need a new car or a new house." Yeah, let's write this thing. This is incredible. Please do. Yeah, let someone just do whatever they want with it, and they get they all endorse. I'll sign off on it. Christopher Tolkien did a really good job gatekeeping his father's work of J- J.R.R. Tolkien. And then as soon as he died, that's when we got Rings of Power because the estate yep. the estate proved it. Yeah, yeah. The estate is some grandchild that just wants to get paid. So why not get a paycheck? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, I. I want to preface all of what we're going <laughs> to, all of the things we're about to say. All the things. <laughs> I want to preface all of this by saying that absolutely 100% uh, this author has every right to share her her views. She has every right to create whatever she wants to create. Uh, she's been given permission well, not, by not, not the Hitler, people but. who own the franchise. <laughs> What's that? She can't create Hitler bot. <laughs> nah, but nah. You draw the line you know, there. That's that's the line. That's the ceiling. Uh, no, no Hitler bots. But like when it comes to her writing, if she was, she's, she can make it whatever she wants it to be. Like she can write that story. It doesn't eradicate the original 
you know, that's it's it's perfectly within her rights to create what she created. Um, having said that, I there's there's a lot of things I don't like about that her take. Um, that it, I'll also th- namely say, namely that it exists, <laughs> right? Uh, and that's what I was about to say is that like if ever there was a book that deserved to truly stand on its own without any other context added, it's 1984. Yeah, it's such a it's a brilliantly crafted novel. It is, it so perfectly encapsulates exactly the ideologies and exactly the story it's trying to tell. It Mm -hmm. ends on exactly the note that it should end on. It's exactly the amount of disturbing that it should be. And it doesn't need another perspective. Yeah, it that's I feel like another perspective harms it, to be honest. That's how you know um, a book is perfectly done. It's when you don't, there's nothing you can add or take away from it. Mm-hmm. And, I, I mean, there's a lot of wonderful things that I've read or watched, you know, series or games I've played or whatever that I would look at it and say, I'd love that. I'd love to have more. I wish I could hear about this character more, or I wish I could know what happened to this one. And, and that's great. 1984 is not that kind of story. No, it's just not. This is yeah. And I, I, I don't know why you'd think it would need more. Especially since it deals so heavily in censorship, particularly the changing of past texts for modern times for Big Brother. This is almost an on the nose joke. Like this this is almost would, a troll yeah, job. But I don't it is, but I don't I don't think that that's what it's intended to be. Yeah. And that's what's so sad and I almost like funny in the tragic sense um yeah of comedy it's uh it under it undermines her take on it because as soon as as soon as i heard oh there's a feminist take on george orwell i i knew i knew before i read the first paragraph of anything i knew that she was going to make it lesbians (laughs) <laughs> I it? knew it was coming. I knew it was coming, and it's you know it's to me it's almost it's not really feminism anymore. Yeah, what they're calling feminism now is not actually feminism. Well, what's funny? I forgot. I think it was Simone de Beauvoir. <laughs> Was uh, <laughs> was um, I think one of like the main like writers of that time, and she, I think, I could be wrong, but she perpetuated the idea the only way to be feminist was to be lesbian. So yeah, that's I, a whole thing. Yeah, but but see, and there there again, that's that's to to say that the only way to be feminist is to eradicate any connection to men whatsoever. It kind of, it's, it, it becomes something different than a seeking of equality. Oh yeah. It's never been that. And it, it, you know, to, to hear people now talking about feminism and I'm sure we'll get flat for this. I don't care. Like how can you have feminists, in a society that doesn't know what a woman is or anymore, you know, yeah. like how can you be a feminist if you if you, we can't even define women as as women anymore? When yeah. the man of when the woman of the years is a ma- a biological male, how can you have feminism? Like well, I, I just I don't to, understand. I don't, I don't know if you're supposed to have anything anymore. <laughs> and well, this and this book is part of that. You know, and and the idea of the Julia character, like, yeah, let's get um, into let's get into that real quick because yeah, okay, okay. so the name of the book is Julia, which is the name of the love interest from 1984. So the book is written as like 1984 from her perspective. Which could you ask for anything less needed <laughs> in art ever? So just to get into that, that's who Julia is for those who aren't who haven't read 1984 or don't remember. Who I thought was a magnificently written character in 1984. Oh yeah, 
Oh yeah. Even more so brought to life. She do, every scene in the book and the movie she's in, she dominates. Oh yeah, she she's very compelling in the film version. Yeah. Unbelievably. Um which I mean, that's almost a that's that's almost a perfect film, I think. Like I love it. It really is a great yeah, I feel one. I feel like it's, it's so overlooked. It's a disturbing, haunting film. It's one of those that like the final Mm-hmm. The final frame stays with you for yeah, and forever. It does. It does the book so well. I don't think you mm-hmm. could do. It. And it's at that time in film history, kind of like the thing or whatever. I think it's after mm-hmm. the thing, where it looks so just good enough to where mm-hmm. it's the old techniques. You can't change it. If you redid it, it would be bad. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And it's got that old grit that you got from filming on actual film mm-hmm. and. Great you know, tone. It, yeah, it's just, and it, it perfectly captured this idea of this cold society where everything that you consume has been carefully uh, controlled. Yeah. And, and curated for you. And, you know, this idea of, you know, breaking out of those, these, the accepted. Uh, plan that Big Brother has for your life, stepping out of that is grounds for lobotomy. Which I think we should do. Um, nineteen eighty four is our first book club. I agree. That would be fantastic. Yeah. Which that really should, would be which a great, we should be a great place to start. Yeah, which we'll be launching pretty soon. I'd like to do. We could do videos of it, and we could write our own blogs with it mm-hmm. as well, and do that together. But, yeah, but like if for and it's been a long time since I've read nineteen eighty four, but I remember parts of it very vividly Mm -hmm. and you know of course it's a very sexually repressed society yeah and you know the the main character you know when he first sees julia and feels a like a desire for her like his in his mind he starts considering even the possibility of raping her which is killing her just just killing her or raping her well she had she had the uh the anti-sex sesh and she was handing yeah. out the anti-sex pamphlets. They supported that party. Yeah. Right. Which was all a cover, but still, yeah, exactly. you didn't know that. But, you know, the whole thing of it is that the two of them start the forbidden tryst, you know, and they're always, you know, they're sneaking off to have recreational sex throughout the end, which is very counter to the, you know, Big Brother plan. And when mm-hmm. you take... You know, her, because the Julia character passes him a note that says, I love you. Mm-hmm. Out of nowhere. And that, like she, yeah, out of nowhere. And she's the one, she initiates a relationship, a sexual relationship with him in which really she, she's compelling because in the book, she really has all the power. Well, yeah, from what the perspective we will be discussing of from a modern lens. Yeah, you're right. And relationship was yeah yeah she 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 has she has the leverage and he's well she really has the she's power she's a good bit younger than him in the book too i think at least 10 yep. at least 10 yep. years i think yeah yeah it's a it's very complex the relationship with them but then i personally i feel like going in and writing a new version of it from her point of view and having it be that well, she actually is a lesbian, and she has this woman that's her, that's her lover. The woman's the one that wrote that note to her, and she passed it to him. It just undermines so much of the relation between the two of them, and it also, to me, it 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 undercuts the the ultimate the way that story ends. Yeah, it it takes away a lot from from what Orwell was was saying about yeah. the way people relate to one another. Well, in so many of reboots, remakes, add-ons, all they do is drag things down. And people, I'm tired of that stupid idea from Disney's Star Wars to Rings of Power to this of, oh, well, you have this, we have this. It's like, no, integrity and like things matter. Like a name matters. Yeah. And having something yeah. attached to something is just awful. It's like it drags it down. It, it weighs does. it down. You you've added some, you've added garbage to it. Yeah. And it I I feel like I if you're a lesbian 
you know, that's that's your choice. That's you know, you're full. You you're allowed to be that. If you want to write a book that's unabashedly about that, if you're a feminist and you want to write something mm-hmm. that's unabashedly about that, you yeah, do that. But write your own story. Don't ride the coattails of somebody else. Yeah. Like, that just bugs me so much. Yeah, imagine how lame it would be to have a Christian production of 1984. Yeah, that would be awful. Like when churches, just, like when churches do the weird knockoff productions and stuff. It's cringy. There was one I saw not too long ago that was so stupid. It was hilarious to me how because it was so stupid. They'll do like Iron like, Man and that kind of stuff. They did Hamilton. Oh. There was a church that did a Christian version of Hamilton. Was it still Hamilton, or was it? Yes, <laughs> it was so bad. That's awful. I'll find, I need to find that video and send it to you. It's so bad. Oh. Yeah, they, it's like with um, King, that King of the Hill episode with you're the not, Christian rock band. Yeah, you're not making rock and roll better. You're, you're not making Christianity, Christianity better. You're making rock and worse. roll. You're making rock and roll worse. That yeah, was yeah, it. yeah, that's what it was. <laughs> well, that's this. Like, it's, you're not making feminism any better. You're making Orwell worse. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, because because the reality is the themes and the presentation of the feminine in that book, yeah, were already powerful. They were already incredibly well drawn ideologies. Like, why do we need something subversive to something that was already? Because, so well done. Because it had a male lead. And I'm, I say that because like I'm reading the article, like a review from New York Times, which, New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> in, in one, this is a paragraph. In one sense, this is the undertaking of Julia as a novel to climb into the fictional world of 1984, as well as the misogyny of Orwell's writing, and flesh out a woman's perspective. Winston Smith, we may remember, has fantasies of sexually assaulting and murdering Julia, and the female characters in 1984 are thin in comparison with Winston's complex interiority and with the wider world of Big Brother. Julia then would appear to fix Orwell's novel for a contemporary feminist readership. Just If you need a novel fix for you, there's something wrong with you. Just, Just as Julia herself fixes the plot machines of fiction. So first I want to preface that nobody asked for this book. It's doing that thing where it claims to speak for people to try to justify itself, even though this is a writer commenting on it. She's going to bet for it, too, for some reason. Um, Yeah, paid to. Yeah, but there's no misogyny in Orwell's writing of 1984. I haven't read all of his writings. There may have been some. The man was a product of his time. But in 1984, a character having those thoughts in a totalitarian regime that has crucified sexual interaction... That's not misogyny. That's showing that this man is deeply messed up because of the regime he's under. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it's the whole not, thing. It's, it's driving it's him a, insane. Well, it's not celebrating his thought. Yeah, it shows like that those are not, terrible. Like it, when they, that's the whole thing. It's the, the depravity that is the result of that society. Yeah. So that's not misogyny. but No, it's not. Uh, yeah, and then moving on for like from a woman's perspective, what is what do you mean a woman's perspective? What does it matter? Like Winston Smith isn't a man's perspective; it's Winston's perspective, and that's the thing is like the female characters eighty four are thin in comparison with Winston's complex interior. Like, well, so are the other men. Everybody is a thin character because it takes place. Everybody in, who's it, not the main character in this not very long book. Yeah, it takes place in his head. It's his perspective. Yeah, he's, it's, it's not. Yeah, it's his yeah. point of view. I, I guarantee you, if you go to any like romance book written from a female perspective, whatever, regardless, Pre- anything by a old Pride and Prejudice writer, fantastic yeah, writer, gonna, I forget her name. Yeah, but it's going to be told from the point of view of that female lead yeah. character. That's how books work. Who wrote that? Now I got to know because Jane Austen. I couldn't remember her name. Anyway, if you if for some reason none of you have ever read a Jane Austen book, you should. Like yeah, she's a behind. she's it's a fantastic. she's a fantastic writer, and it's always about romance and it's always funny and it's always brilliant. <laughs> and Pride and Prejudice is a fantastic book. Um, let me see. It also embellishes the prehistory of 1984. 
which defeats the whole purpose of the poem. Because, and come, yeah. and loops around, and she yeah. adds an epilogue. And imagines a future beyond Orwell's ending. Unlike Winston, Julia was not born in an Oce- and born an Oceanian citizen. That doesn't matter. That's lore. That does not matter. And has had to learn ulterior tactics of survival. But I thought in Orwell, she took she talked about being like in the youth and like being part of the youth programs and all that. Didn't give any reason, any semblance that she was from somewhere else or anything like that. No. Not that I recall. It could be in there. I don't recall I, that. I, I don't know. But then again, it's she not gives, about she her. She's no. not the main point of the book. Well, she gives a she gives a history of herself. I remember that it was just, it was just like you grew up in the whatever the whatevers the whatevers. Like she was always part of the things and always was like you know breaking the rules or whatever. That's the whole thing. Uh, yeah. And that's the whole thing is like her her she is a foil to Winston who is, who remembers a time before and was is beaten down by this. She is in this, and she's pushing the boundaries. She is the one that's pushing the boundaries even more than he is. That's the whole thing. It, it and she, yeah, that's yeah. that's what makes her such a compelling. It did the cringy when they talk about Harley Quinn introduction, like she's crazier than him or whatever. It does it actually well. <laughs> yeah, it, it makes it work. Yeah, and you know, and that's why I say like she has, she's got more power than he does. Yeah, throughout the majority of that story, she has way more agency than he does. Uh, there's another paragraph on the point. Julia is at its most compelling in its exploration of the grim, re- grim reality of women's lives under an authoritarian patriarchal regime. All right, the regime in 1984 is not patriarchal. It is actually no. it's actually based off Soviet and other like it's, it's so- state. socialist state ideas. Anyone can it's be the part state. of the party. Just be, Big Brother is just an idea. He but they used brother. They didn't say father. Which is what a patriarchy is. If they use the picture of a woman, would it be a authoritarian matriarchal regime? No, there's no higher, there's no patriarchal structure in 1984. No, it's it's all the party. It's anyone, male or female, can be part of the party. A few chapters in, Julia is summoned to repair a block toilet. It goes into like a of an abortion scene for some reason. That's just disgusting. Um, it, it's to show a, a female. A, a woman that was a victim of a male authoritarian figure, which they got to keep up with Britney Spears's memoir. I don't know what you're talking about. I really don't want to know if it's that. Ugh. She, she's got, that's been the big stink is that she says that back when she and Justin Timberlake were together, he forced her to do a, like a, an abortion at home because he didn't want to be a parent. She wanted to have the baby and he pretty much forced her to do an abortion at home. And, and like, cause he didn't want to be a parent. And it was like, she said, it was like the most awful event of her entire life. And it's been all over everything lately. So maybe they, maybe she just felt this author and felt like Julia had to have something like that go on. I don't know. Well, that's disgusting. <laughs> Abortions are only bad when they're preaching, according to this group of people. <laughs> um, let me read this paragraph. Julia, we are repeatedly told, loves to have sex. Now, that's in 1984. That's part yeah, of the Yeah, absolutely. As absolutely. A, as a child, she had sexual fantasies of big brother. As an adult, she's approached to work for the Thought Police as a honey trip. I don't know if that's from 94. I, I could be wrong. I don't remember it. Eventually, though, she's arrested and tortured by the Ministry of Love. Well, that was because she was with Winston. While in prison, she discovers that her sexual activities have been used not to identify traitors, but merely to deal with the staff issue. None of that's in 1984. The ministry is racked with departmental vying. Fiction is after records wants to take over its functions and its budget. None of that's in 1984. It turns out Julia serves no greater purpose than culling the male staff of records, paving the way for fiction's monopoly. No, you're a toothpick, a tissue, Julia is told. A thing that gets used once and thrown in the bin. (laughs) Julia's sexual appetite, ostensibly a symbol of empowerment, ends up being used as a pawn in fiction's game. I don't think they know how ironic that paragraph is. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. It's like, you, you've done to her what Orwell didn't. Yeah, and you've shown that it was terrible because I, th- I, think, uh. there's a, I think there's a scene in 1984 when they're talking about it and Winston in his head is like he he wants to go in, you know it's almost like a Marquise to say thing where he's like I want debauchery I want like uh filth destruction like mm-hmm. what whatever is against Big Brother 
Right. Yeah, and and he actually did a better job of showing, I guess, that in his writing under an authoritarian regime than than this did. But I can't read that paragraph again because it's just so it's so ironic. Like, <laughs> and it's it's also like weird. I don't certain things, certain pieces of art you can judge without engaging in. I can tell this book sucks without reading it and I'm not going to read it I'm not going to participate in it even if it was a free PDF I'm not going to waste my time staring at a computer screen to read it it's like me not watching The Flash yeah I don't blame you it's trash but but remember whenever uh, Angry Video Game Nerd got hate for not reviewing Ghostbusters the new one mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like no I can tell this is going to be bad <laughs> so, yeah, why would I why would I want to go watch it why would I spend money on it yeah so <sighs> It's the same reason why I'm not going to see Aquaman 2. Yeah, that one looks terrible, too. Or like 90% of other movies that are coming out. It is. And, I mean, just going back to that paragraph, like, it seems like this whole backstory with Julia, the reason she's captured, it just undermines, it cuts out Winston's involvement. Mm Mm-hmm. That's what I was saying from the get-go. Like, it undermines, like, what makes that story matter. If you're going to write a new perspective of the story then it's it's one would think that that story means something to you yeah if you want to write a a expansion of that world you would assume that the original means something to you but it's clear that this this is someone who whether they realize it or not apparently they they hated the message of the original and want to change it yeah because that's the only thing that makes sense to me. If if these are the changes you're going to make to it, then clearly you don't, you didn't love and respect the original source material. Yeah, it's such or, a, or you didn't understand it. Well, it's always it's always dressing it down. That's what it says. Um, instead, its main project seems to be redressing, which means complaining about the gender balance in Orwell's fiction. All right, here's the thing: in Orwell's fiction, it's the main character is a dude. That's the thing, gender balance. But if you read 1984, it talks about how the party did everything to destroy the differences between genders and sexes, which is what exactly. the socialists did. That's what. Yeah, it, the idea yeah. is it's showing what they that you know that particular group of people claim to want to see is an eradication of all gender identity or. You know that's that's really well, yeah. what it's and, that and that's why so many stands for so many people for. who claim progressivism or claim socialism and, and they claim you know the, the abolition of of the sexual differences and all that stuff. But it's like man, that they've already done that. It's already been experimented with. They did it in Mao's China. They did it in Stalinist Russia. It's the same thing. And all it did is it put everybody in the gray jumpsuits and into the field. That's the point of yep. it. Yeah. That's yeah. It's like, oh, now we're now that we're comrades, everybody can go work in the fields. <laughs> yeah. Now you can yep. now you can kill women and children as easily as you can men, because you see them all the same. Yep. Yep. Um. Yeah, and not not to beat a dead horse, but yeah. I I just I don't think that this revisionary version of this story needs to exist. It, it's okay that it does. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt me that it does. You know, it doesn't. No, but it does hurt. Eradicate your, it does, the original. It does destroy part of someone's soul. Because oh, yeah. if you knew 1984 existed and you have that canon, and someone prevents a, presents a subversion to it, the point of a subversion and a negation is to destroy it in your eyes. Well, and that's why I was yeah. saying that this person can't possibly love the original or have respect for it, or this is, or they wouldn't have tried to, like you said, to subvert it. Yeah, it's 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 in poor taste. It's in poor. It's in it's in bad faith. Yeah, and it was clear that the to me that the like we said before, the estate clearly don't they don't care. No, and. That's that's just a that's a depressing thing as an artist. Is you think anything I make is someone going to shill it out? Um. And I think it's better not not to pivot to us, not to make this about us, but it's our podcast, dang it. 
I think with the canonization project and going as punk and kind of almost as open source as possible, you can get ahead of that because people will know yeah. what's canon and what isn't. And that's what Star Wars was for a long time. There was so much fan fiction and there was EU and um, all this other stuff and everyone was fine with it until Disney came and said, we are the canon. Mm -hmm. You know, people are fine with things being in and out of canon and, and being fun. But when you say this is part of it now, you, you just ruin it. When you take all the stuff that was created and you say, well, that stuff's just legends now and you, it's going out of print and all that stuff. <clears throat> and, you know, those were things and stories that people loved. And it's funny that now everything they're creating now is has worked its way back around to trying to do the stuff that was in the expanded stuff that they decanonized. Yeah, because they had no, they have no plan, no ideas, no nothing. And yeah, they have to go back to that well to draw from it. And some but would, they've already screwed it up. And some would argue it's the same thing because Kathleen Kennedy's whole force is female thing. By throwing a feminist message into Star Wars, you ruined it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah when it was it already had especially I me mean, my gosh julia and uh, princess leia if you want to talk about writing great female characters those are two great ones right there i mean ripley I mean, uh, ripley of course is the Rip, yeah is the Ripley's standard a great archetype but princess leia is a I great was, archetype leia is great um Ju uh, i'd I say love, julia is great from 1984 yeah i love um alita in uh battle angel yep. Oh, anime always had great female characters. Oh yeah, anime has great female protagonists. the The idea that every society, whether it be a real one or a fictional one, has has to be misogynistic. It has to be that the women are kept, you know, kept crushed under every. That's just not. That's just a myth. That's not real. Mm -hmm. it's the you're you create a villain that isn't there so that you can yep. pat yourself on the back for killing it now there are some there are well, some, there are yeah. some but like yeah. they don't you know you don't they don't exist everywhere in and in, in every single piece of literature no and most it doesn't of the, have to be about and that and there's not literature from them in our modern world really <laughs> exactly um uh no that's what i was gonna say with that is um the idea of the whole the, the patriarchal society you know that kind of thing like, i i don't know i don't want to debate but like if you're if you believe kind of the stuff like this writer explain marriage to me how does marriage benefit men and i don't mean that from a manosphere modern era i'm talking about if you're a, a crusader on a horse back in the day how does marriage benefit you if you can take whatever you want and you literally have military power, what is, how does marriage benefit you? And it doesn't. It's like that entire institution was created for the benefit of women. And for and the benefit men got out of it was to prove that their children were their children, basically. And yeah. and everything it else was minimized. and everything else, the material that was it was to provide material protection for women. Yeah. Yeah. And more well, and, and more. You know, than for material protection but yeah you know and I'll, you know to go back to what you were saying about leia being a great character some of these characters being so great the best thing about ripley and the reason i love her in the original alien is i mean they she's definitely feminine mm -hmm. she's allowed to be feminine she does she's not like butch per se she's she's working class mm -hmm. they treat her like one of the guys. Nobody yeah. ever interacts with her as though she's any different or any less than anybody else. She she ends up being the only competent person on that ship, pretty much. Yeah, and, and the only one that has any good sense. And and really, they they don't allow her until the second movie, really, that Cameron did is when she becomes motherly. Mm -hmm. But in that first film, she's just she's just the one person on that ship that's the voice of reason, saying, "Guys, like, really, mm -hmm. we're gonna bring that inside." Well, some of the, some of the uh, most of the other people are just like, "Well, it's not my job." Yeah, they don't care. But He's responsible. Yeah, well, if you did want to do something, 
if you had to talk about gender differences in it, she does have the feminine approach of safety protocol. And yep. that's, she's like, we're not letting it. This is against the protocol, you know, and yep. she's thinking of safety first instead of profits or exploration or, you know, danger or high risk, high reward. Mm-hmm. And what's funny is all the men on there are weak or kind of weak men. They're, yeah. They're, yeah, yeah. Based, they're being told what to do by a corporation that does not care about them, and they're just doing it, risking their lives for it over and over and over. And then yeah. literally a machine is the more masculine of all of them. He's the aggressor. And, you know, and then you have you do have another female character on that mm-hmm. ship who we really get to see both sides. We see yeah. the Ripley represents the feminine side that's the the protector of of the of the order like you said motherly yeah about like yeah the motherly side of let's say safety first on this stuff then on the opposite side we have a character who is she's she every time anything goes wrong the other female can i don't even remember her name which is the blonde here yeah speaks to her character she's his she is hysterical yeah and she's the one She's the one who is killed by the alien in a very sexually suggestive way. Yeah. She's the one that gets taken advantage of. Yeah. Because she's hysterical. Whereas, you know, Ripley represents the sta- stability of a mother character. And then we have an actual computer called Mother that's the cold, distant thing that mm-hmm. doesn't actually care about you. Well, and it's no mistake. And Geiger was part of the design of that, um, which Geiger is fantastic. But um, the alien is very phallic. Well, yeah, that and it's invasive. Yeah, and I mean, it literally, you know, I don't know if I can actually say this word on YouTube anymore, but it literally, you know, uh, forces itself on people yeah. to replicate. It so, penetrates. You yeah. know, it's yeah, and you know, all of that stuff. Lambert, that was her character. Yeah, Lambert. Um. Uh, but like you could say that that's one of the most feminine movies ever made Mm -hmm. or feminist movies even yeah 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 but it does it well it does it intelligently and it does it without having to hate the men that exist and subvert the men that exist it shows people as they are why does dallas die because dallas is brave enough to climb into the vent with the the flamethrower to try to go kill the dragon you know yeah why do the guys in the the mechanics guys why do they die because they're lazy and stupid and they mm-hmm. try to you know they they aren't paying attention they're not responsible and they die yeah, everyone everyone is looking for someone else to make the first move in that movie and that's yeah. what that's what kills them um and this is an interesting point after kane's infestation that's a nice way to put it. By the face hugger. Yeah, I like that. Uh, Lambert berates Ripley for refusing to allow her and the rest of the team on board. She actually uh, goes the other, the opposite of Ripley with it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's the but that's problem. But that's it. the hysterics. Yep. Yeah, it's not thinking the best way to do things. And like I said, she's not thinking. It, it's a, To me, it's an interesting character because she doesn't. I know we're kind of switching topics, but whatever. I don't care. No, well, but, but it's they, still on the same. It's still on yeah, track, though. She doesn't behave like a man. She doesn't Han Solo or Indiana Jones like go off the cuff and do her own thing. Um, now she does at the end of the second one, and does it in a motherly but, way. Yeah, that's the thing. Is yep. it's only because the child is in danger. Yep, and she does it. Well, and it's the same thing. She goes, "I know what that's dangerous." And that the whole point of Alien, to, I, would, I would say Aliens, is an even more yeah. feminine movie because she spends the whole movie telling these hyper masculinized people, men and women in that movie, yep. you guys yep. cannot fight your way out of this. Yeah, that it's you're, bigger than you are. Yeah, you, you, all of your bravado is going to fail because that thing is, is cold, relentless death. Mm-hmm. And, it is only, and I mean, if you want to do it, that is a metaphor for death. You can't fight it. And the only way to beat it is to replicate, is to yep. be a mother. Yep. Yeah. So, which is, yeah. you know, that's all of that to say that you can do a feminist film or a feminist yeah. novel, a feminist story. Define feminist, yeah. You can do it without, you know, er- 
nesting in and killing something else that's better than what you're creating. Yeah, you could do it, it uh, but you have to be a man to create it. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a man to make it. We're going to get canceled. Yeah, who cares? Even get... <laughs> I know, I know. No, I but, don't know but, you're but Term Terminator and Terminator 2 are the same. Oh, yeah, dude. Sarah Connor's incredible. Yeah. And that's the whole thing. I think we've, we've already talked about that before, which is fine. Yeah. But I mean, but how does she conquer the cold, relentless death machine? By being a mother. Yeah. And it's almost saying, you know, and I don't know, Terminator is a perfect for the archetype of male and female. It's a perfect example of it. Time is literally coming to kill you. Man's create yep. man's creation is coming to kill you. How do you conquer it? Through natural, the nature, uh, natural rep reproduction. And the man gives mm -hmm. himself to save yep. what 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 is being made, and that saves the future of humanity. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And then the second one, of course, is the mother takes her role as mother and protects her child to save the role of humanity mm -hmm. with a surrogate father, which is what it's the creation the son will eventually make. His future, yeah. his future is to is is to save them, and you only get there by her protecting him, who is the future. Yeah. Yeah. two perfect movies yeah and then everything afterwards just yeah and um that was James Cameron wasn't it yep 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 I'm was and uh yeah, Ridley so, Scott was the other one yeah you know so like you know we can we can wrap this up by saying that mm -hmm. you know yeah the day may come when somebody tries to do a a feminist revision of the Godfrey universe but it'll be over <laughs> my dead body yeah <laughs> Well, we already have so many great female characters. It'll be fun to see. Oh yeah, that'd be and and see we we've, we've tried very hard to make it where we don't have. There's no hopefully there's no need for someone to come in and say oh well they they really messed this up. Well, there was no need to, there was no need for this either. That's there's the no whole need point. for this yeah. either. But that's well, that's the whole part of critical theory is you create a problem, you problem problemize something so that you can be the yeah, savior you, of it. You build a dragon and then slay it. Yeah. So, yeah, it, this one just hit really bad because I love 1984. And people mm -hmm. chalk that book up to being, like, overrated not, or whatever, overdone or classic. It's a classic for a reason, man. Like, and, yeah. I mean, I've tried Brave New World. I'm going to try to reread it. but it, And I know that one's pretty accurate, but it's not as well written as 19, 1984. It's not. The, 1984, yeah. is, is it, it deserves its status and... It just is, it's more relatable now than it ever was in the past. Like, it's just continually relevant. Yep. Yeah. You're right. That's a, and that's a great, I think that's a great way to end it. So, uh, I did the opening promo. Do you want to do the closing promo? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, so thank you again for, for listening, for watching, uh, however you're consuming this. We appreciate it. Uh, comment down at the bottom. We want to. We want to talk about this. Maybe you think we're wrong. Probably, Tell us we probably wrong. are. <laughs> I'm sure we are. I'm wrong 99.9% .9 of the time. I'm wrong. Um, but we thank you for listening. Uh, like like we've already said, you know, like, subscribe, join the mailing list, get online with uh, our website, and and just check out some of the stuff that's out there. And be looking for the first chapter of Apolly on 20XX. That should be coming out very, very soon, and we'll have the uh, pre-sales uh, up and running definitely in the next month. Within in November, Before Thanksgiving, you'll have an opportunity to go ahead and, and buy in. Um, it's it's just it's exciting to be a, to be able to live in a time that's as inspiration as as inspirational as the one we live in, and to be able to create things together. Like Dan, I appreciate always having to getting to bounce ideas off of each other and, and create something that we can stand behind. Um, I don't know if you got anything else to add. Yeah. Instead of trying to like pick the carcass of someone else's work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, like the Godfo universe, we'll go ahead and give a big thumbs down to Julia. Julia. <laughs> it's, it doesn't need to exist. No. <laughs> if you don't like that, then who what, a, cares? what a great review. Just just put zero stars doesn't need to exist. <laughs> All right. See you later, guys. Peace. Peace.